And what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to episode 179 of the Designated Players Podcast. The Red Bulls are back in action. League's Cup is over, which means we are back. With League's Cup being over and Messi doing messy things, we're here to talk about League Cup. We're here to talk about if it's a success. We're here to talk about some commonly cold takes on Twitter. Uh, and we're here to talk about some some Im- improvements. <clears throat> things that we can do to make the entirety of the tournament better. If anything at all, maybe it doesn't need anything. I don't know. But Connor, how are you doing, buddy? It's been a little bit. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you doing? Oh, I'm tired. We're in preseason. So, uh, you know, 12, 14 hour days. And it's uh, it's a lot of work being out on the field all day. But we uh, we're working. We're working in a good spot and, and getting players uh, ready to go. So. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be back on the pod. I'm happy to, to get back to sharing some of our, uh, common W takes as we always know we have, um, and I'm, and I'm also excited to share some scarves. So what do you got? I figured you were going to go with the other team. So I've busted out the other finalists. For... That's awesome. Have I seen that before? I'm pretty sure I've brought it up before. It's just been a while, but Got the uh, Nashville band together scarf. I love that. That's it's a awesome. nice one. I gotta, yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Yep, I did. Uh, I was kind. Of, I was close to going with Nashville, but I didn't remember if you had an Inner Miami scarf. So I brought up Freedom to Dream in I honor of our Miami scarf. Yeah, I thought you did, but I wasn't sure. So I've got the Freedom to Dream one. That's a nice we, one. Yeah, it's it's not super great quality, you know. It's one of those those meshy or silky uh, scarves. Yeah, it does the job. It's uh, it's black and white with some pink <laughs> trim, and it does what it needs to do. But leagues cup twenty twenty three is over. Two leagues, one month knockout tournament that saw Lionel Messi, Sergio Busquets, <laughs> Jordi Alba, and an eighteen year old center mid from Argentinian American descent go from the single worst team in the league that couldn't put four passes together to the uh, the single greatest attack of all time. <laughs> <laughs> to just put it simply. Um, no, you know, they, they come in and they were, they were really, really good. They were challenged a little bit. But there were some really good stories in there, some fantastic matchups great games and some really standout performances. I kind of want to ask you first, what was your team that was like, wow, I can't believe they made this run. And don't say, uh, don't say Miami. So I know you picked, I know you picked them not to get out of the group because you don't know ball. (laughs) Um, I will go with Charlotte because I don't think Charlotte's been great in the league this year. Uh, Let me see if I can find where they sit right now. Loading 13th. They are 13th in the Eastern Conference. Granted, they have a couple games in hand, but I think the most they can move up is about 10th ish. So, not a great season for them so far. And they made the semifinals of the League's Cup. So, definitely a strong run from them. I mean, obviously, they got smacked around by Miami in the semifinals, but, you know, that wasn't exactly. Uh, I think you mean quarterfinals. No. So, oh, yeah, yeah, you're yes. right. Yeah, you're right. I made the same mistake, but I wanted to, I wanted to catch that. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yes. Quarterfinals. I will still pick them um, regardless. I think they made a very deep run for a team that I did not expect to make a deep run. Uh, beat Cruz Azul in penalties in the let me get the round right this time. Round of 32. Round of 16 beat Houston and then got beat by Miami. Uh, granted, not the most difficult route, but still way more than I was expecting from them, even to just get out of the group stages and make a bit of a run. Um, the other teams that were in the semifinals are all strong teams to me. I mean, maybe a couple are a little surprising, but I'm going to go with Charlotte just based on the fact that my expectations for them, I think, were low. I don't remember my prediction exactly. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to go take it to uh, a team south of the border. Another team that made it into the uh, quarterfinals of the tournament by the name of Querétaro. A team that 
I'm just going back really quickly here. Since 2019-2020 season, had not finished over 10. I'm sorry. In 2019-2020, the Apertura, they finished in fourth. But in the Clausura and every time after that, they finished bottom half of the table. They then go on to beat Pumas, New England on pens, and nearly get by a very good Philadelphia side before getting knocked out of the tournament. In the group stages, they came in. Come on, switch over. In the group stages, as it loads. Goodness me, come on. Picked a really bad time to be slow. Um, Where are we? There it is. They finished second in their group stage behind Philadelphia, but they gave Philly a run for their money money in both games. Uh, So very impressive from the Liga MX side. And I guess my question for you is, what is the most disappointing team for you before we move on? That's a tough one. I know there are some good teams that didn't get out of the group stage, but I don't necessarily want to knock them because there were a couple groups like we talked about in our prediction that were just stacked. <laughs> like They were just filled with uh, really good teams. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with a team here and it's not because they underperformed my expectations because my expectations were already pretty low for them, but I feel like I'm going to go with them because they went even lower than what my low expectations already were for them. And that team is Toronto, Toronto FC. We talked about them. We talked about them being in a relatively like not strong group. They were with Atlas and NYC. That is, that's a group where the talent on the Toronto roster should be able to get out of that group. And they went and lost both games with a combined goal difference of zero goals scored and six goals conceded. Not a single goal was scored. I'm granted it was only two games, but not a single goal was scored for them in this tournament in a group that was, you know, they could have competed in this and they conceded six. They looked awful. They played terrible. Uh, and it was somehow worse than I was already expecting for them. That's a that's a good one there. I'm so you know, I, I also you I need I deserve some credit here for not picking Red Bull as the best team in the con- in the tournament after topping their group of death between New England and ASL. Put some respect on their name. Um, I think mine is pretty easy. I can go with a couple here, but for me. Austin FC in a team with Mazatlan and FC Juarez, who were bottom feeders for the last three years in Liga MX, to show up, score two goals, concede six, both at home. That's a good one. That's a good one. Like, goodness me, guys. I know I know you guys aren't doing – I mean, you're all right in the league, but come on, man. You The hate, the Haiti team, the, the Violette embarrassment yeah. in, in Champions League, now you get – smoked by two absolutely like not even mid Liga MX teams just <laughs> bad Liga MX teams and this team is going to be like fifth in the fifth in the west this year it's it's that that they, was a really bad one they hate a knockout tournament man they really do <laughs> bro i'm telling you if this if this was just a one off like league cup from 2021 where it was like four teams and you just see what happens maybe but man, that was that was definitely my my least impressive team. My, I guess the the real question that's floating around right now that we should probably address was this league's cup a success? Was this did this league's cup set out, or did it achieve what it set out to do? And I'll I'll let you go first. I got, I'm not sure what like how I would define what the the goal was at the start, but I would say it's a success. I mean, the entertainment value that it brought was phenomenal. Uh, it, it was just a nice change of pace from like this point in the MLS season where it just kind of gets a little dull and stale because it's like it's the middle of the season. You're just kind of playing the same MLS teams over and over again. And, you know, it's not like you're in the last couple games and you're fighting for your life for a playoff spot or something. So it was a nice mix to just throw something new in there. And 
get to play a few new teams, you know, and get to play against some Liga MX teams who, you know, for a lot of MLS teams, they don't get that opportunity because not everybody's making CONCACAF Champions League every year. So I think it was a, it was a good idea on the surface, and I, I think it executed really well uh, additionally. I think there are things that could be worked on, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it. But entertainment value, I mean, I thought entertainment was way better than I expected it to be. I think that's a that's a perfect way to put it. I think that you had a tournament that had or you you had an idea to say the biggest soccer viewership in the United States right now is the Mexican American population. They love their Club Americas, they love their Monterey's, they love getting those guys in. How do we get them to look at MLS teams as well? And that's I think what this was about. It was a way to expose the league to a different demographic of players of, of people of, of supporters and i think it was a great success look at the turnout for the liga mx fans all over the country right it wasn't and again it, you know you had your your smaller clubs the juarez versus mazatlan that had 200 fans in austin stadium that was not great but you look at the club americas you look at the monterey's you look at the turnout for those types of games that is what this was all about. It was getting full stadiums. Again, as you mentioned, playing against Liga MX teams in something that mattered that wasn't just Champions League. I think it was a fantastic success. You you mentioned entertainment value. Goodness me, was this an extremely entertaining tournament. And I will come out on record and say, the, I was one of the guys who was like, I'm not sure about this. This doesn't real. I'm not quite sure this is something we need. I'm not quite sure this is something we should do. I can't wait for it to come back next year. So much fun. I really, really enjoyed a lot of the aspects of what they did. And you could feel that it meant more than just a friendly or a game in, in Champions League where we were in preseason. We kind of knew the odds were stacked against us. And we wanted teams to win, but we didn't have a, a, a horse in the race for the most part, you know. You've seen Atlanta in the Champions League. I've seen Red Bull in there. But there are teams who don't watch their their team in, in Champions League for a long time. So they're not as drawn to it. Everybody had a, a horse in this in this race. And then there was also the bragging rights, the League MX versus MLS bragging rights, which uh, the better league won, of course. But I think it was a massive, massive success. I really, really enjoyed it. I think a lot of people were surprised by it. And I think what you'll end up seeing is those empty stadiums that you did see. So I'll take Red Bull as an example where our stadium was very, very empty on those weeknight Leagues Cup games because everybody at the beginning had that same thought. The This is just going to be a, a, a glorified friendly. It doesn't matter. I don't want to be there. So they didn't opt in in their season ticket package. I think you see everybody opting in, most people opting in this year for the next, you know, iteration of it and those tickets are actually going to go for something because they were a ton of fun to watch and you saw as you got to the quarterfinals the semifinals the finals the stadiums were sold out whether Messi was there or not help it helped that Messi was there but whether Messi was there or not Nashville sold out right St. Louis sold out everybody who was there sold out so I think you're going to see a lot more engagement over the next couple of years when this becomes commonplace you know the first year it's always going to get bumps and bumps and bruises but Overall, I think for the first year of the iteration, big success. Very, very happy with it. I enjoyed it a lot. I guess there were some people who disagreed with our take here, and they thought that it was not a success. They didn't like it at all. Um, and I figured we can run through some of the things that we've seen on the Twitter sphere, and or the X sphere, whatever you'd like to call it, and just have some thoughts. My first one's one of my favorite ones. League's Cup was rigged for MLS and MLS only, uh, and specifically for Lionel Messi to win everything um, because, they could, because they had a very clear and defined path for that to happen. Uh, I'd like to hear your take on the ways that MLS gigabrained this tournament such that Messi was the only one who could possibly win it. Well, I mean, I thought it was pretty clear from game one 
that the script for Messi was was in place <laughs> and it was going well. I mean, free kick in the last minute of the game to win it. Like, come on, at least hide it a little bit. Uh, I mean, I, yes, it's it's very obvious that it's not rigged, but I will say that there are things that definitely gave MLS sides an advantage over the Liga Max sides. Uh, and we'll talk about it at some point, I'm sure. Um, we'll find the right time in the episode to talk about it, but definitely not rigged, definitely not rigged for Messi or MLS sides, but uh, I do think there were some advantages to the MLS sides. I, But I still think overall it wasn't like a huge advantage that like completely changed the entire landscape of the tournament. But uh, I think it's something that they should work on for for next year. I'm just curious how the anti MLS crowd comes in and says that. And then when they ask how and they point to one single referee decision, they're like, it's rigged for the entire for the entire league and for the best player in the world to be the best player in the world. Like they've never watched a game before where a referee missed a call. Yeah, seriously. (laughs) And I've never like it's just really funny to me because they will complain and and I say I say anti MLS crowd, but it's also League MX crowd was there. And I'll I'll point to the Club America game, one of the most exciting games in the tournament where Club America scores on a penalty kick in the ninety first minute from a sketchy handball and nobody says a word. Nashville comes down in the 99th minute. Sam Surridge scores, gets to penalties. Nashville loses on the last kick. Fans storm the field. It takes 15 minutes for them to get off the field because the the referees are trying to clear them. Then they say, hey, nobody leave. VAR is telling us that we need to retake this kick. So they clear all the things out. They go, they score. Club America ends up losing. And everybody is trying to put screenshots up that say, well, what about this, 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 and this? Without actually recognizing that the VAR made the correct call in this instance. Were there missed calls everywhere? Yes. You can point out a lot of them. Philadelphia had a goal called back in the in the uh, third place game last night that called Daniel Gazdog offside, who was, I think, three defenders away from the play. Never stood in front of the goalkeeper, never touched the ball, never did anything in terms of influencing the play, and they called a third goal back for offside. And nobody nobody said a word. But because it wasn't against Liga MX or it wasn't for a, a, a messy uh, to win it all type of thing, nobody, nobody cares. Like, if you were to break down every game, and I'm not going to, but if you were going to break down every single game and every referee decision, you will find that those calls even themselves out. It's just the way the, the game works. You can do it in any league, any tournament, any country. It's football. That's how this thing works. It's how it always works. To say that it was rigged for MLS to, to do it because the referee missed one call and the greatest player in the history of the game hit a game-winning free kick is silly. I don't know. That's just that's just my two cents on it. Um, did you see any other calls that you thought were really funny that you wanted to share? No, nothing's coming to the top of mind. I don't know. I wasn't really focused on right and wrong referee calls. I mean, it, it's like you said, people people will always remember the calls that go against their favorite team. Nobody will ever remember the calls that went for their favorite team. Yeah, that's correct. And by the way, that foul that set up Messi's first goal for Miami, the game winner, that was a foul. Like, it's soft, but it's a foul. He came through the back of him. Did Messi go down easy? Yeah, but so does everybody else. Like, if that was a, a Club America player, or I think they were playing uh, Cruz Azul, that was a Cruz Azul player doing it on the other side, and they didn't, and they gave it, nobody would have said a word. But they're just mad because it was Messi, right? And I get it. You need You need a villain in every game and whatever, but a lot of the calls that people were complaining about were actually the right calls, and they were just upset because their team lost. I don't know. And that's both ways, by the way. Like, MLS got a couple of calls against them that I thought at first was a bad call, and they ended up it, it ended up being the right call, and it's like, okay, good, you got the right call. And they also got hurt by calls that shouldn't have been been given, and that's just the way the game works. So um, <laughs> the, the next one I really like here, 
Uh, it's usually the uh, the anti MLS crowd, less Liga MX and just anti MLS crowd that says League's Cup wasn't actually a real tournament. It was just a cash grab so owners can make more money. <laughs> well, I'm sure the owners made plenty of money. Anybody that got to play against Messi probably made boatloads of money. Uh, but I don't know why you wouldn't call it a real tournament. I mean, what was it then? Like, was this just like a bunch of friendlies? What do you call this? I don't understand. Th- that is was that, is is this like the equivalent of the Audi Cup in in the U.S.? Like, is is Harry Kane on his way to try to win this fake tournament too? So that was that's always my favorite thing is like MLS will never be a real league unless what is what is a fake league versus a real like what does that even mean? How do you look at something and be like, oh, this isn't real? Like, they're not a serious league. Like, I don't know. Anyways, for me, um, this comment usually comes from the same people who will drop hundreds of dollars to go watch U21 teams from Europe play against each other in a friendly on American soil and then justify it because they're European, as if it wasn't just a cash grab for the European owners themselves. That's usually the, the group of people who would do that. It's the it's the LOL MLS sucks and and this is just a cash grab. I can't believe people like it. And then their bio is like glory, glory, man United. Like you, you you're clearly out here doing nothing, you know, beneficial. Um here's the deal. Did it make money? Yes. Was it meant to make money? Maybe. Was the what were we talking about? The whole point of this was not a money grab. The whole point was to expose different people to different types of games. What came out of this outside of, of, you know, some bragging rights? MLS clubs or, or winners of Leagues Cup, Champions League, whatever, are now getting invited to play down in, in South America, in, in Copa Sudamericana and, and all these other, other international tournaments, which is something we've been asking for for years to get exposure outside of the Caribbean islands and, and Mexico. We're finally getting this exposure. And people are angry because we did it through League's Cup instead of through like, you know, I I can't even think of a different way to do it. But there's just like it was just another feather in the cap of the anti-MLS crowd that was like, um, I don't like MLS and people are upset about this. So I'm going to make some random complaint and and just run it out until it, you know, I beat the dead horse. And I don't know. I think it's a bit silly, but. You know, Why does it even matter if it's a cash grab? Like, what do you think the owners are doing with the teams in general? Like, you think that they're in it for the love of the game? Like, you think James Harden is an investor in the Houston Dynamo because he loves MLS and he loves the Dynamo? He probably doesn't even... I, I wouldn't be too surprised if James Harden doesn't even know he's invested in the Dynamo. Like, he does it because it's probably like a, a recommendation from his financial advisor or something. Like, oh, you know, the the valuation of these leagues are growing every year. Like it's good to get an investment percentage in there. Like, like they're, they're in it to make money. They're not in it for the love of the game. I mean, maybe some of them are, that would be ideal. I mean, obviously you'd want an owner who actually cares, but I mean, let's be honest, look at half of the teams in this league. NYC doesn't still doesn't have a stadium. So it's hard to say that their owners care. <laughs> let's, let's put it this way. Why does anybody go buy a team in Europe or put, put, you know, stake in their, in their, teams in Europe it's not JJ Watt did not go to Burnley and was like oh my god I love soccer I can't wait to put money into Burnley yeah (laughs) no he put it in because Burnley were three games away from getting promoted to the Premier League and if he put money in right then the second they got promoted his investment trip Mm -hmm. what a how like but again it's it's a it's a conversation between like oh we need to we need to hate on one thing because it's not exactly the same as something else but then when it, it gets brought up that it's the exact same thing just with a different you know background then it's excuse city but you know well, yeah I, I don't understand like what's what competition is not a cash grab like correct think think about how much money the premier league brings in like what do you that's a huge like Plus for owners and the like, the, everybody plays and like, like dies in the Skybet Championship playoffs because if you can just make it to the Premier League for one season, you get a massive payoff that probably saves your club for like years down the line. Like that's that's the reason to make it. Like obviously, plenty of fans are gonna be like, you know, like they want to make it 
not from a monetary reason. Like, obviously, the fans going to want it to do it for the accomplishment, the prestige of it. But like the owners, they want to make it because they're going to make a ton of money. Like, it's like it's every league, it's every competition. They all want to make money. And if if there are league, if there are leagues and competitions not making money, they probably won't last because the owners will just stop putting money into it. Well, and 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 the biggest point to that, I think you make a really good point there, is everybody wants it to be fan driven. But anytime we suggest something that says, hey, maybe you should support the league yourself, find a team and do it, there are nine excuses of why they won't do it. So the the complaint of we need to do things so that you know we have more fan interest, those complaints are not from the people that we're trying to draw into this. It's from the people who are never going to be here in the first place. Everything is done for money. Doesn't matter what league you're in. Man City aren't signing $100 million defenders because it's fun. They're signing it because if he can play 15 games and win them another trophy that gets them another $150 million, they just made money. It's always money. It's like people pretend like it's the, it's it's always the love of the game, and it's it's just not. It's just not. Let's finish up with this last. Uh, oh, unless you have something else you want to add. No, nope, I'm ready for the last one. Let's finish up with this last uh, Twitter sphere comment. League's Cup doesn't actually count because Liga MX. Yeah, go ahead. Tell them, Grace. Tell them, Grace. <laughs> MLS is clear. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. Wise words. Um, League's Cup doesn't actually count as a real tournament because Liga MX had to play all their games away. Yeah, that was one of the points that I, that I kept alluding to earlier that I wanted to talk about. Um, does that invalidate the entire tournament? That would be insane to say. But to say that it has no effect, I think would kind of be a little... What's the right word? I guess like... It'd be kind of ignorant to say that it had no effect. I mean, I think they had to do an excessive amount of travel, especially compared to a lot of the MLS sides. Um, and I think it's something that they should look to implement in. I mean, even if or as early as next year, if they can do it or in hopefully somewhere in the short term in a couple of years, implement some games in Mexico, get some teams to travel down there, even if it's like two Mexico sides facing off against each other. Uh, and obviously, I don't know all the logistics behind everything here, and I'm sure that they had some kind of reasoning as to why every game was played. And I think every game was played in the U.S., uh, but it definitely has an effect. I mean, I saw the tweets and stuff about teams being like stuck at airports and having to do all this traveling. And it, I guarantee you that it has some effects, but it certainly does not invalidate the entire tournament. Um. So. It was U.S. and Canada. They played. They played some games in Montreal and Vancouver, and that. Here, here is my favorite part about this: is this comment that basically is is simping for Liga MX sides is usually made from USMNT Stan accounts that were straight dunking on the Mexican national team like three months ago. Like, you go from. Full support against any 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 Mexican nationality player at all, and the second it becomes Mexico versus MLS, and not just USMNT Euro based players, it's like, oh well, Liga MX had all these problems. We have to give them all the blah 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 blah. <clears throat> Did they do a lot of travel? Yes. Here is my big kicker with this. Every time. An MLS side got knocked out early in a Champions League. And we said, yeah, that's usually what happens when a team from League MX who has unlimited spending is midway through their season, you know, been training all month, goes up against a side that's played together for two weeks. You know what the answer always was? Tough. Too bad. All teams should be able to to get up and play whenever they want, right? Usually from League MX fans or or anti-MLS guys who who want to see the you know the leagues fail or whatever, right? The second it gets flipped and we're like, oh, well, yeah, Liga MX had to travel for two games in a row. And they had to do it, you know, overnight for for two two group games. 
everybody's like, oh, that's not fair. The, the tournament's rigged and, and, and it shouldn't count and, you know, all this stuff. It's not fair. And League MX deserves a fair shot and blah, 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 blah. Stop with the two-sided, you know, argument. You can't have it both ways. You can't say that League MX gets a, gets a pass because MLS is in preseason. But the second MLS has a slight advantage in anything else, it's like the whole thing doesn't matter, you know? It's fair. That's a, that's a fair point to make up. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I think uh, Champions League has always been a little bit of a disadvantage for us, just considering that teams are just starting their season. I think this is kind of a good reverse of that because league the I think the Liga MX season is still pretty. It's still yeah, pretty it's like, like four games in. Yeah, it's pretty early in their season as well, so it's it's a nice little like kind of reverse card on that one. You get a little bit of a chance for MLS sides to kind of be in their regular season form at this point. Uh, I mean, I still would like to see games being played in Mexico as well. I think it would be ideal to get a little representation across the board. You know, get we have a couple of games in Canada. I'm sure most of the games will still probably be in the U.S., uh, but it would be nice to get a couple games in Mexico. Uh, I Again, I don't know how easy that would be with logistics. It's probably a lot easier said than done, but then at least you can... Re- I mean, you... Yeah, I was just about to say, at least you can remove like any excuse that they can come up with, but there will always be an excuse. Some there will always be some reason as to why if an MLS side does better that it was rigged and you know they got some unfair advantage. So and and, and here's the thing, right? That's not bad. Having that like excuse game and Twitter exchange and you know, fans going at it with each other, that's not bad. Right, you're in, you're increasing engagement. You're getting people to actually watch, and if they're going to complain, they're going to complain, right? But that makes somebody who hasn't watched the league before be like, "Man, maybe I should take a look at this." And then they see something that Messi does, and like, "Oh, I love it," or they see something that Hani Mukhtar does, and like, "Oh man, that guy's awesome." That's how my buddy, um, you know, massive, self-proclaimed, I think, Euro snob, big Barca guy, you know, always always took dumps on the league. Messi came over and he bought League's Pass. And then he started watching Nashville. He's like, bro, this Honey Mukhtar guy's a baller. I go, yeah, dude, he's great. And then he's like, dude, Lucia Costa's fantastic. But yeah, dude, he's great. Right? People will make excuses. The people who are the biggest outspoken critics of what we do mm-hmm. never have watched a game in their life. Or if they did, it was 10 years ago. And we've had this conversation. The people who are actually willing to give it a chance are the ones that aren't tied to this ideology of like MLS has to die for everything else to be successful. That's a silly little uh, thing, but no, uh, the league, the league set this up with the president of league MX or the president of the Mexican Federation. I don't know who really drove it. And they said, Hey, we want to play all games in the United States. How do you feel? And they said, yes. Why? Because there are more fans, more money revenue. They're getting t- they're getting profits at the tickets. They're getting merch sales. They're getting they're getting a percentage of all of it, and they know that they're making more money there than it is here, and that's important because it allows the game to grow. So, is it a cash grab for owners? Maybe, but as long as they reinvest that, which most teams do, by the way, you know there are teams that won't, of course. But when the majority of teams do reinvest into their youth academies, into their stadiums, into their players, it grows the game. It makes things better. It allows us to do more things. You can complain all you want. It was a successful tournament. However, are there things that they can do to make it better? You've already hit on some of it. Is there anything else off the top of your head that you think could make it a little bit better? I don't know if I have anything off the top of my head. I'm sure there are ways that we can make it better, but I feel like it's in a really strong spot right now that I wouldn't want to mess around with it too much. Do you have anything? Yeah. So, I mean, you, you mentioned games over the border. Um, I saw a really good tweet and I don't know who it is. And I I apologize. I wanted to give them the shout out, but with preseason, I haven't had time to prep as, as much as I would have liked. Um, 
that basically said, hey, at the end of every year or every or at the end of every League's Cup run, rank the teams 1 to 50, whatever. From there, that's how the seeding works for the next year. If there's an expansion side in MLS, it starts at the bottom. But that's how the expansion works, or that's how the seeding works. You know, one versus, you know, one, one, you know, I, I don't know how it would draw into a hat. Maybe do pots and pick one, two, three, whatever. But that's how the seeding would work. And then you do home, home and away based off of um, the seeding. So if you're, the, if you're in the, the number one seed, you host both games. Right. If Club America won this whole thing next year, they would get to host all their games, something like that. I think that's pretty cool. And I think that'd be a good way to do it. Logistically, would it work? I have no idea. Probably not. But I think that's a great way to do that. The other thing I would probably like to see is less like changing the group stage. I think 15 three team groups was just a little too much for me. I think that just uh that that just ran it to the uh to the ground there. So um you know, I, I think it'd be a little bit better. What is it, five, eight? So what about nine groups of five, maybe, and then the top three? I, you know, you could do a whole bunch of different combinations with it, but the three team groups were a little a, a little crazy for me. So, but I did, I did like a couple things as well. Uh, so what were some things I guess that you liked? So I don't continue to just go on a tangent here. Well, I'm going to jump before I do that. I, if you, if you were to change it to nine groups of five, you're now extending the tournament a lot longer because now group stages are probably going to be four games mm-hmm. and you doubled the group stage length. And on top of that, you have still all the knockouts. So unless you're going to maybe cut down on the amount of teams that make it to the knockouts. Like maybe instead of a round of 32, you go right to the round of 16. You could do it that way. Uh, but I guess that depends on whether or not you want more group stage games or if you want more knockout games. I mean, I, I get the appeal of having more knockout games. It's like a meaningful one-off game. So I'm sure that gets people more excited. But uh, things that I liked about it, I mean, the entertainment value was great. I love the fact that there were no like ties I mean, obviously, in the knockouts, that's that's obvious. Like, you're not going to have any ties. But uh, I like the fact that they ju- they would go to shootouts and you didn't have situations where people were just getting... Um... Well, I guess people got a point, right, if they lost the shootout. Is that how it went? Do I have yeah, right? so if, you, if you, you had three for a win, two for a shootout win, mm-hmm. one for a shootout loss, zero for a loss. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I I like how quick I, I'm actually, I guess, going to go against what you had said. I kind of like how quickly everything progressed in the tournament, a really quick group stage. I feel like it kind of was able to. I mean, two games is really quick and it probably doesn't always give you like the best teams that should move on. But it's like it's enough that like you could filter out the Toronto's Um and then it, it got you right into the knockout rounds, which is where we got so much excitement because now, now it's win or go home. And you had multiple games or where you had to win or you went home. And uh, I think that definitely amped up the entertainment value. Because like, I, if it's Cruz Azul Nashville in that insane game, if that's in the group stage and it's like game one, I don't think it has nearly as much excitement as it does in the round of 16 where the loser is done the tournament's over. So I think having the knockout games is a good uh, excitement factor for the, for the competition. Obviously the messy effect was massive. I know that's not necessarily the league's cup itself, but his impact on this tournament was insane. Like I was following Miami score lines and I have no affiliation with Miami be just because I mean, well, first of all, his, the headlines were everywhere, uh, but he was just so exciting in this league cup. It was just every game was something amazing. Messi did. And uh, I mean, overall, the the entertainment value for this tournament was outrageous. Lots of goal scoring, uh, lots of exciting moments and controversies, stuff to get the headlines. I think the best part about the tournament hands down was 
the pe- the no ties penalty kick shootouts. No extra time. Go straight into the thing that everybody loves the most. And there were some belters of a PK shootout. I mean, the final is just one of them, but Leon and Vancouver went to like oh, 16, something outrageous. Yeah, 16 shooters or, or 30 something. Like yeah, it was like shot. 30 something total. It was yeah, like like stuff that you don't actually get to see all the time. And and I was just reading a, a quote from Don Garber here <clears> about moving it home in a way. This is a really good chance for Liga MX clubs to provide their fans living in the United States as an opportunity to see all their teams, as opposed to just two or three teams that are here summer after summer. It's also economically, you know, it makes more sense. We get more fans here, whatever. Um, so I don't think they're looking to move it out. But another person just made a, a really good point. If they're going to do that, designate a home stadium for Liga MX teams, right? If you're going to bring you know teams over and we do that ranking thing, okay, fine. We'll still do it in the United States. But, um, you know, Monterey, who are the, the highest ranking, uh, you know, League MX side, you're going to play every game that you have in Austin Stadium. And you're never going to move until, you know, you, you have to play somebody above, right? That's another great way to do that. So that's how you can make it better. But, yeah, the, the penalties were, were out of this world. Fantastic. You could feel that the in- excitement of playing against the League MX team, again, for something that mattered, was good. You went into stadiums that were packed with Liga MX fans. It felt like a hostile atmosphere. It felt like they were really, really pushing for something, and they were. And again, as you mentioned earlier, that we're in the middle of MLS season. Games get dull in July and August. They just do. They're they're not at the very end where you're pushing for the playoffs. They're not at the very beginning where it's a new season. You're excited to see new players. You've got players who are out injured, international duty, whatever. Things just take a slow, you know, stuck in molasses type of feeling. This was a really good way to re-energize the soccer crowd. Uh, So really enjoyed it. I don't know if there's much more they can do to make it better. Uh, You know, the the idea that they could designate home stadiums would be really nice. Um, You could change the group stage, but I think you made a good point against that. Um, Here's the thing. The the best way to make this better is for all the fans to buy into it. You can go around and say it's a cash grab and there's no real point in playing it. But at the end of the day, here's the point. You got a $2 million cash prize waiting for you at the end. You've got three Champions League spots on the line, which gets you, if you do well enough, into the Club World Cup, where you will play against the Real Madrids, the, the Saudi League giants, apparently, that are now all coming you are going to get to play the best of the best if you succeed in this tournament. Like U.S. Open Cup, it is now one of the fastest ways to get to the promised land of club football. How do you make it better? Fans buy into that idea, support their teams, and make it such that every game is a rocking stadium atmosphere that just, it's fun to be around, right? That is, I think, the best way that you can make it better. The, the, the league and the leagues and the teams, they can't do it. The fans can make this better way before the, the leagues will. But that's just my two cents. I have, I have one last thing I want to mention on this. Um, one thing that I think that they should do, and I would like to see them do, is market the star players of this tournament more. Because the spotlight is... 100% on it at this point, like next, even next year coming around again, assuming Messi is in the, even maybe even if Messi is not here, the spotlight is going to be on the tournament for how, you know, exciting it was this year. And to the exact point that you mentioned before with your friend who, because Messi started playing here, started to watch the tournament and was like, Hey, this Hani Mukhtar guy is great. Hey, this Lucia Costa guy, he's awesome. He's really good. Why don't we market the, market more guys like that go market a denny buanga who's balling out you know Halong wane was killing it this tournament like get get these guys like get these names out to more people who are now getting exposed to the league get people familiar with their names and now they've got somebody to watch when league's cup is done so league's cup ends maybe you fell in love with a hani mukhtar because you came for messi and you were like, wow, this guy's awesome. Like, look at him, you know, willing this Nashville team all the way to the final and almost beat Messi. 
now you can go watch Hani when it's all done. You know, it's not like this is the end of the season. And you got to wait a couple of months before they start up again. And, you know, the excitement dies down. Like you can go watch Hani presumably like probably two weekends after this tournament is done. And you can go follow all these players now that you fell in love with from this tournament. So I think they need to market the star players more, get, get more headlines on some guys other than Messi. Obviously I get why you would put all of the headlines on Messi, but <laughs> get some Hani Mukhtar's in there, get some other exciting guys on there, Lucia Costa, whoever you want to put on there. NYC picks up some really exciting young South American on his way to Man City, get his name on a billboard somewhere or something like I just I think it would make people kind of get attached to the teams and the tournament more than just I watched it for Messi. Yep, I I, I think so, too. And again, that, that comes with the fans. The fans can buy into that because you can you can go ahead and, and market whoever you want. But if the fans aren't going to buy into it, they're not going to buy into it. And, and it goes back to a, a deeper conversation of, you know, football and culture in America and and. You know, what do they really want to see? And, you know, at, 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 you know, we can that's not a conversation for tonight. But that is, I think, I think the best way outside of the Federation, outside of the leagues, outside of the teams, the best way to make this meaningful is for the fans to make it meaningful. Everything matters if you make it matter, right? Nashville and Red Bull played in the same tournament. Nashville was a fortress. You went in there and you were terrified because Seas of gold, blue, white showed up and supported their team because they knew that this tournament mattered to them. The Red Bull played in quarter-filled stadiums with fans who didn't really think anything of it, and they got bounced in the, in the sec, second knockout round because they didn't have the support and, and whatever. If the fans want this to matter, they can make it matter. So that's a conversation for another time and um, we won't go too deep into it, but uh, thank you guys so much for listening and, and for hearing our thoughts. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I definitely did. I love the league's cup. I can't wait for the 2024 uh, iteration, but for now we, we, we take a break from league's cup. We let it go and we come back to MLS with 12 games to go and the big playoff push. So make sure you're following us wherever you get your podcast. So you can hear our thoughts on the season as it goes on. We will do our usual uh, who stays, who goes in, in free agency. We're going to go in and do our predictions for the last, you know, five to three to five games in the season of who's going to make the playoffs, who isn't. Um, we're going to do some playoff predictions. We're going to do a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, so make sure you're following us when we, you know, when we get that stuff out, then go on and, and follow us anywhere on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Uh, we're posting tons of our clips there. So you can go and engage with us and interact with us. Those are a lot of fun as well. But until then, until our next episode, we will see you on our next. Oh, I messed that up. That was a bad one. <laughs> we'll see you on the next episode of the Designated Players Podcast. See ya.